continuing our unit on secular song, chapter 38, entitled Marketing Music, Foster and Early Popular Song. Well, we're talking about Stephen Foster, Foster, and we're talking about early popular song in America. And I'll probably tell you more than you want to know. 19th century songwriters in the United States combined elements of European art song and opera with other traditions to create commercially successful popular music. Referring to European art song, what's that? The lead and the leader, that's what that is. Or in, in, it was actually in England, it was an air, we didn't study about it, and in France and Italy. So anyway, arias are, are uh, European songs, art songs. Songs often were popularized through minstrel shows, which were racially charged theatrical variety shows. The minstrel and parlor songs of Stephen Foster, including Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, we will sample that, were very successful during his lifetime and remain so today. A little side note here about American music. And uh, when you talk about American history, uh, a, a great reference point is the Civil War, 1860, 1864, approximately. What came before that? What came after that? Uh, and so before the Civil War, American music, after the War of 1812, when America defeated the British a second time, we kind of don't pay attention to that, but, but they did uh, try to uh, overtake the colonies once more in 1812. But uh, regarding music, Singing and sheet music became widely popular, particularly uh, broadside songs. And I hope you don't mind that I read this because I write, write this stuff. But when I write it, I don't overlook anything. And it's uh, as concise as I could be with uh, the written word. So um, allow me to, to read about broad song, broadside songs or lyrics printed on a sheet of paper and sold for a penny. The sheet had no music, but instructed the purchaser which popular, well-known tune the words could be sung to. People sing, and they know songs, and they learn them in school, they learn them in bars, they learn them in church, and so uh, they know songs, and you write a, a poem, and you say, wow, this fits with this song, and that's why I wrote the poem, because in my mind, I'm expecting you to sing this, my words with the song that I'm identifying. The songs often had to do with current political or military events. On the other end of the artistic spectrums, we had broadside songs, sheets of paper sold for a penny, and, but the Boston Handel and Haydn Society, which was formed in 1815, performed Handel's Messiah in its opening concert. Pretty high-level stuff. Finally, singing played a large part in one of the most significant social movements of the time and all of America's history, the Second Great Awakening. And we talked about that from 1790 to 1830, wave after wave of Protestant evangelicism swept across the country. Tens of thousands of people would attend a single camp meeting marked by enthusiastic preaching and audience singing and participation. And I don't make this stuff up. I get these facts off, off the internet. and It's always right if it's on the internet. But so uh, 10,000 people would attend a, a festival like this and it might go on for weeks. So this is a way of homogenizing America, making things the same. You have these traveling groups of entertainers that are from the East and uh, where everybody knows this style and then they go in, into the West and they bring those same songs. And so all over America, uh, the United States, people are experiencing the same type of, of music and the same style. 
these more informal services, referring to the uh, camps uh, from the Second Great Awakening, these social movements, uh, led by itinerant preachers, also helped tie settlers on the Western frontier to the cultural life of the rest of the country. The Second Great Awakening also fostered greater participation by women and African Americans who continued developing their artistic tradition of spiritual music during this period. Another side note to the side note, Francis Scott Key, 1779, 1843, uh, regarding the War of 1812, which we just referenced, Francis Scott Key wrote a poem called Defense of Fort McHenry in 1814 during the British bombardment, spelling, of Fort McHenry in Maryland. Francis Key watched the attack while he was being held on a British ship in the harbor. So the, the British ships are, are launching missiles at the fort, and he was abducted and held there. He was a lawyer. Within a week, he wrote a poem. He wrote a poem, and it was published as a broadside with the suggested tune, the popular song, which was a British song. And many people knew this song. So it's right away he publishes it and they say, okay, sing it to this song. Key was a lawyer and a slave owner, but freed his slaves in the 1830s. He often wrote and spoke out against slavery. A number of people that were wealthy people freed their slaves during this time upon the realization that they didn't want to be part of this uh, inhumane activity and uh you know thomas jefferson as a young man he realized that if he could get land he could be rich because once you have land then you can get slaves and you can make money off your land because of the free labor just because you own slaves and he was right but it doesn't mean it was a correct uh way to behave so the song right that Francis Scott Key wrote the words to and poem officially became the U.S. National Anthem in 1931. Regarding minstrel shows, uh, early on, and again, we had slavery until 1864 when we had the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863, I'm not sure exact word, year. But uh, plantation owners would have, owners would have parties. And uh, they had this big thing with a table and cakes, and they had these walk-arounds and marches and things. And the slaves themselves would be attending and taking care of things and, and making food and uh, cleaning up after whatever. They started to mock this in their own uh, time that they had by themselves. And it, it, this was going on for a while. Then the, the, the plantation owners saw this and thought this was really cool what the slaves were doing so they started to do this as part of their parties and uh it's it's kind of a the whites um mocking the blacks mocking the whites but it was uh turned into be a a major uh form of entertainment minstrel shows which started out which is small groups of people putting these shows on. And then it grew to be like maybe as many as 40 people uh, before the Civil War, because, uh, well, things changed after all the slaves were freed. But before the Civil War, this kind of grew into be a major part of entertainment would travel all around the states where they could make money. Because this is, again, something that you do entertainment entertainers do it to make money and some of them made lots of money doing these types of things so a traveling show would come to town uh, and uh, in the morning of the show they would have a parade through the town you remember there's no tv there's no movies uh what do you do for entertainment wow there's a parade you go and see what's going on and then you say well i gotta go to the show tonight and that was the whole motivation uh, of them doing the parade is so they could sell tickets and the, so the show grew into be uh, three parts, uh, a first part, a second part, third part. And the first part, surprisingly, is called the first part. 
and everybody is seating. And, and so you would have maybe, let's say, 30, 40 uh, people on stage and they would be in a circle and they would sing a song and there would be musicians. And then there was a man on the right and a man on the left. And uh, they were like the jokester and there was a, a, a MC. Motion detected at the front door. There was an MC that um, was the, called the interlocutor. And he was a straight man, and these other fe fellows would make the jokes. Anyway, th th this in the circle, they would. Um, uh, this is how the first part of the show show would go, and uh, then the middle part of the show was called called the oleo. They would drop the curtain, and in front of the curtain, they would have uh, these acts come out of small groups, uh, and this is really important because. Uh, these little skits made up specialty acts. And this part is the forerunner to vaudeville where you have these little small acts for maybe not very long time. And uh, oftentimes instrumentalists, trombones, trumpets, banjos, etc., performed solo entertainment on their instruments, including animal sounds and whatever novelties were made into the show, right? This is supposed to be entertainment. And it said that this was training for many performers in the early stages of jazz because they were really exploring their instruments and to uh, be impressed, to impress somebody, right? either with uh, some silliness or some strange sounds or just virtuosity, any way that you could impress people. And there was capable uh, people of doing this. And apparently this is, was the standard um venue right to so the middle part of the show and the third part is called the afterpiece uh which was this plantation or levy scene right or or burlesque and of course everyone was in blackface and most of the humor was racially motivated the music was not genuine african-american it was whites doing something were black so it was kind of i don't know what it was it was Anyway, this was entertainment with the sole goal of selling tickets. White people would put their paint their faces black with shoe polish or something like that. And and it later, uh, after the slaves were freed, uh, many of them were very talented and were hired to perform minstrel shows. Minstrel shows continued after this. And... Um, some, most of the black people had to put blackface on too because they would say they weren't black enough. So, uh, comment here. It's important to recognize that the intent of minstrel shows was to sell tickets and make money. I don't believe the intent was to promote hatred or violence. It was stupid humor. After all, almost all humor involves somebody getting hurt in some way or insulted. And then as well, during these minstrel shows, they had a, had usually had a section in the audience for free blacks. And later, some of the performers were blacks in blackface. And after all, being a performer was a good job. But I do believe that after the American Civil War and the freeing of all slaves, Racism became full of violence and hatred. Uh, also, not all whites were or are racist then or now. The Civil War was fought as the result of whites that knew slavery was wrong. And the Civil Rights Movement in 1950s and 60s uh, could not have existed or made any progress without the support of whites, although some of which were also racist. It's like uh, Lyndon Johnson, he he was a racist, but he knew it was wrong. And and but he was like main um, reason that a lot of these laws were put into place to to be fair to to whites and blacks. This is an example of uh, the opening part of a minstrel. Hey, Jack, and that thirty is a sweet song. Gee, that am a beautiful song. I love the old time songs. And so do I. They don't write songs like the old songs no more. 
Indeed they don't. There's my old Kentucky home. That was a great song, too. And home, sweet home. Yes, that was a good song, kids. I never did have a home. Talking about the old songs reminds me about 15 years ago when I went out to Kansas with my little dog, Bluch, and my jackass to raise the for corn, for cabbage, for watermelons, and for beef. Mm -hmm. Three weeks after I was out there, my little dog, Bluch, he died. The poor little Bluch died. It left me all alone on the farm with my jackass to raise the for corn, for cabbage, for watermelons, hey, you get the and idea. for beef. Another comment. As well, racism and bigotry is found in many forms and not just whites against blacks, but of course, any group against a seemingly dissimilar group. So bigotry works both ways. So we have to be careful and recognize it so we don't become part of it. It's easy to be with friends and, uh, and suddenly showing bigotry attitudes towards another group. And so when that happens, just don't be part of it. That's all I have to say. Uh, during the 19th century, there, these others were and are specific forms of entertainment. The medicine show, camp meetings, circus, dime museum, sideshow, minstrel show, English music hall, Chautauqua, concert saloons, beer gardens, variety theater, music halls, minstrel halls, musical comedy, amusement parks, public gardens, Wild West shows, all leading up to vaudeville. And you, you uh, it's, uh, again, there, this is mass entertainment before we had TV and movies. Uh, so in American music, we can divide it into the cultivated and the vernacular. And uh, the cultivated was based on this Europe European uh, culture of high art, operas, chamber music, symphonies. And that was here in America uh, in, in uh, some extent. And then, of course, we had vernacular music that was sung at home and public events. And then, but it was curious that it would be intermixed. And so both you'd go to a concert out at the gazebo and on Sunday, and they would have both types of uh, vernacular music and cultivated music at the, at the same concert. Uh, here is a poster for a minstrel show, right? Posters advertising minstrel shows often used images of performers, both in blackface and costume below and the, in the photo, in the, uh, poster and in more formal poses above these are the same people here in blackface just so you know this show is about this so people went and bought tickets to be entertained and to laugh and you know did black people talk uh like the actors doing the minstrel show i i don't know but it was funny enough for them to get a laugh. And that's what it's all about. So here is an illustration for the popular Stephen Foster song, Camped on Races. So how does this all tie into Stephen Foster? Uh, so Stephen Foster songs, it's intersection between this uh, European art song, like Leader, and the American uh, vernacular music, parlor songs. Some of his music he sold to minstrel shows. As a matter of fact, uh, he was from Pittsburgh, and when he was a young man, he wrote songs. And uh, apparently, a minstrel show was touring and visiting Pittsburgh, and the leader of the minstrel show heard, like in a barber shop or something, Stephen Foster playing the piano and singing one of his songs. And the minstrel show bought the song right now. I said, okay, I'll give you $25. And which he did uh, many times would sell shows just for uh, the immediate uh, paycheck and never uh, got any, any royalties from the success of the songs. And so Stephen Foster 
made a living doing this, but he did not make as much money as he should have for the popularity uh, of his songs. Uh, he wrote songs like, Oh, Susanna, right? Camped on Races Day, Old Folks at Home, My Old Kentucky Home. And unfortunately, he uh, died a young man, right? 30, 34, 30, 38 years old. I believe like he was in New York City, but he was an alcoholic and apparently fell and hit his head or some silly thing like that, but he died. Young. And here's Stephen Foster. And uh, he wrote this song, one of his songs we're going to sample, uh, called Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. I think it was first uh, called, it, it was in regards to his wife named Jane, actually. And I guess he thought Jeannie fit the song better. And maybe he didn't want to embarrass Jane. I don't know. But uh, we've had different times of America, uh, certain groups of people that were large, and uh, like the Irish, uh, are here many uh, immigrants from Ireland and were worked in police forces all over in the East Coast and, and then became mayors and things like that. And the same thing with uh, other times with Italians, Germans, were so many Germans here in the 1890s, they were wanted to make laws that you had to speak English and uh, things like this, uh, this silliness. But anyway, it was, that's the way, way America history is. Um, the point is, Irish music was popular during this time, and uh, we're going to hear it performed uh, by an Irish tenor. So he, it's kind of a bittersweet thing because he's he's singing about, uh, I guess he and, and his wife split up, so he was upset about that and wrote this song about her. The title page, Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, 1854, before the Civil War. So it's strophic, right? What is that? It means, uh, again, every stanza of the same music. And it's it's a song. Look at this. Solo voice and piano, just like the lead. Homophonic texture, simple accompaniment. Let's listen to this song by Stephen Foster. For 
for a genie with the light of brown hair floating on. To review, a parlor song, a song generally accompanied by piano, intended for home entertainment at Thurman's, particular to 19th century America, when people had parlors. So you had a room in the front of the house that was kind of like a museum, where it's like, don't go in there, and we don't want any candy wrappers or, or newspapers laying around. Everything was all nice, dusted, because you never knew who was going to come to your house, and you met them in the parlor. And it was a very formal setting. Uh, and then, so this is where you might entertain guests also. And, and people would be singing these songs and have a piano there and for entertainment. And the minstrel show, we talked about what that is more than you wanted to know. But it's part of America, at least our, our music history and entertainment industry. It really has roots in um, the minstrel show and then onto the bottom line. That's the end of chapter 38 on Stephen Foster and the American song equivalent to an art song from Europe.